Okay, we're going to get started with our class this, this evening. Um, just a, a way of reminder, especially for those of you that maybe are visiting with us, the, the class that we're doing, one, what you'll need for it is your Bible, and the next thing you'll need for it is a copy of this booklet, The Gospel Message. If you don't have a copy of that and you would like one, raise your hand, and Bishop and Jackson are in the back. They're going to help hand that out, so if you need one. Um, the, the hopes for this is, as we've talked about, the host for this is for this to be more than a class book. It's a tool. It's something that you keep close at hand. You keep it in your car. You keep it somewhere at the house where you can access it very quickly and look it over because we're going to have a bunch of questions that have been filled out, and we're going to be able to have confidence in the things that we talk about so that when we hand this to somebody else, maybe we hand it to a coworker or a friend at school or we hand this to somebody and say, you know, if you'd like to get together and talk about it at some point, we're comfortable and we're confident in the things that we're talking about. And that's the reason we're going through this. Uh, you might think, you know, these verses, I know all these. I've memorized all these. Do I, do I really need to fill this out? Yes, fill it out. Because it just goes to help solidify that in your mind. It just goes to help to refresh you and make you ready for when you have an opportunity to share it with somebody. So uh, a couple other things to talk about before we get started. At the end of this class, about roughly 40 minutes or so, we're going to have this, this discussion. And then following that, you're going to hear, hear some bells ring, just like we do at the end of, of all of our classes. That's just signifying that this class period is ending. We're, we're really trying to encourage discussion. We'd love to have all sorts of discussion going on during the class. But once the class period ends, we're going to transition into our evening worship service. And we'll treat it as such. So just in case anybody, maybe there was some confusion about why the bells rang during the last one, that was the reason for that, just to let us all know the class is coming to an end, and then we'll begin our service with an opening prayer. Uh, so just to make sure that everybody's on the same page with that. Uh, we're going to be talking this morning about lesson, I'm sorry, this evening, about lesson number one. We talked a little bit last week about the purpose of this lesson, honoring Jesus and His Word. It's about Bible authority, and we're going to talk more about that and kind of dig in that a little bit deeper tonight. But before we do that, I just wanted to pause and let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful to be able to be here today to study from your word. It is such a rich blessing that we have to have your thoughts, to have your actions recorded for us that we can easily remember them and that we can be guided. I pray, Lord, that we will never take that, that great blessing for granted. I pray, Lord, also that we will always approach your word as it is the word of God and not the word of men, that we will hold it with all authority, that we will raise it up and we will submit ourselves underneath it. Help us tonight, Lord, as we prepare this to, to begin this study, that we will see ways in which we can help other people to see that, to see that your word is authoritative, and also help us to prepare ourselves to share with others things which vi that, that, that challenge that authority. Help us to do so always in a manner that pleases and glorifies you with gentleness, but also with boldness. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through this material, the, the fear that we often have of evangelizing will be replaced with confidence that your gospel is the power to save those that are lost. We love you, Lord. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so simple definition of evangelism, as we talked about last week. Simple definition of evangelism, getting the gospel message in front of the lost. Getting God's power to save in front of the lost. That's all we're trying to do with evangelism. So if you think, I'm not a very good speaker, I'm not a very, very good at being persuasive in arguments, that's okay. Evangelism is simply about getting the message in front of lost people. We talked about some ways we could do that. We talked about the cards, put, some, put something in somebody's hand, whether it be a card or whether it be this, this material right here. Um, one we didn't really talk too much about is the bulletin. Roger d writes, does a lot of work for us each week writing that bulletin or getting somebody else's thoughts into that bulletin, but putting it together so that we have something to, to, to grow by, but also so you have something that you can take. How many times have you taken that bulletin, you read it, okay, and I took it home, and maybe it ends up in the trash can. I've, I've already used it. Something else you could do with that is give it to somebody else. Just pass it on. Maybe you have a, a co-worker. Maybe you have a friend that's religiously minded. You say, hey, you know what? This was interesting read. Maybe you'd like to read it sometime. And if they throw it away, they throw it away. That's fine. You've put 
the gospel message in front of someone, even if it's not a gospel-related article. It's got our website on it. It's got our building address on it. And what do we talk about with our building address? This is one of the greatest investments we have in evangelism. We have invested a lot into this place where we come together to worship, but when we have visitors here, who is ever, okay, who's ever taking a kid fishing? Raise your hand. Have you ever taken a kid fishing in your life? You've done that. Okay, you've taken a kid fishing, and they are excited to catch a fish. There's, maybe they've talked about this for weeks and weeks. I want to go fishing. Take me fishing. You finally take them fishing, and they're, maybe you're in a boat or you're on the bank, but they catch a fish, and they get it in, and what's the first thing they do? Anybody? Ooh. Ooh! Get it away from me. I don't want to touch it. You take it off. Ooh, that's gross. Listen. We want to be fishers of men, and we want to catch them and bring them into the boat. And sometimes they jump right out of the water and right into the boat with us, and they show up here at the building, and we go, ooh, and we just kind of stand back. We're standoffish. We don't know them. They're different. Let's not have that fishing mentality that kids have. This is what we want. The building is a great place for evangelism to take place. You can go and talk with them and and start sharing with them some of the passages that mean the most to you. You can put something in their hand. You can take them out to lunch and make sure that when you do that, you're interjecting gospel material into those conversations and into this relationship you're building. A thing that I like to think about is the rule of five and five. Five and five says five minutes before and five minutes after. I'm not talking to any of you. I love you. You're my friends. You're my family. I'm not talking to you. I'm looking for our visitors. For five minutes, you can spare that. You can spare that, I know, because some of you are going to be here for five hours after service is over, still talking. The guy that's supposed to be locking up is going, okay, let's go ahead. Let's move this outside. We have all the time in the world to talk to one another. If we have a visitor here, let's just take five minutes to go reach out to him, just say, hey, how are you? It's good to meet you. I'm glad to have you here. You know that we're studying this material. Would you like it? Has somebody given you a copy? You know, I try to give a copy of this to our visitors. But if somebody's already done it, that's great. That's what we're looking for, is just, just being more evangelistically minded. Well, if we will do that, if we will take those steps, that's going to help us continue to gain confidence, and that's going to help get the gospel into the, into the lives of other people. Before we go on, is there anything else? Maybe this week you've thought about this and you went, I know another way that we can make evangelism easy. Remember, I know another way we can get the gospel message in front of other people. You want to share that? Go ahead and do that now. I apologize. We're not going to have them on the board like last time. I decided I just can't write quick enough for that. But has anybody thought of that during the week? It's all right if you haven't. What I want us to do for the rest of this class and the remainder of the, of the series is as we go through the week, be thinking about these things and come here ready to share. Maybe, maybe you have an opportunity this week while we're going about our lives to give this to somebody. Or maybe you give a card to somebody. Or maybe you just you change somebody's tire. Something happens and you're able to share the gospel with them. I want you to come here and let this be our story time. Let this be the time where we share those things. And if, you, if you're one of these people that maybe just has this notion like servants never tell people what they're doing, so I don't want to be boastful or bragging, then just say at the end of it, will you pray for that? Because if we're praying for it, it's not boasting anymore. We're asking us to pray that God do something about it. The point is, I hope that we'll let each other know, this is going on. If I can do it, you can do it too. It's not a very difficult thing. It's not a very hard thing. Help us gather together as as a family, as a unit, around this thing that we are called to, sharing the gospel message. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with tonight's lesson. The recap that I I just want to do really quickly on the index index is that we have four lessons. And these four lessons are meant to guide us through this this material in a way that focuses first on what we're going to talk about tonight, Bible authority, and then on what the Bible has to say about salvation. How do I get from lost into a relationship with God? We're going to start with authority. We're going to move there. And after we get to to, to lesson two, we're going to move on. To our, I'm going to save relationship with Jesus. What do I look for? I'm, I need a church to, to be a part of. What does that church need to look like? 
What does God's word say about what the first century church that followed Jesus looked like? And then lesson four is growing in grace and knowledge. It is really just an overview of the New Testament. We're actually not going to have a class on that. We're not going to spend any time in here on that. We're going to go over the first three lessons, and then we're going to try to start implementing this in our life. When you get to lesson four, lesson four is just another opportunity for you to spend time with them saying, hey, look, this is God's word. And as we talk about that in lesson four, maybe there's something that stands out. Maybe we can continue studying by looking at one of these books that's in the New Testament that it talks about. It's just another opportunity for us to spend time in front of somebody and try to talk about the Word of God together. So lesson number one, honoring Jesus and His Word. It's we need to be having your, your books open to page number one. Why is it important? And I asked this question last week. Why is it important for us to begin with Bible authority? Why is it important for us to begin with Bible authority? And Jason, do you have the, the audio? No. Whoever has the audio, would you make sure it's on audit, the classroom setting? Thank you. Why is it important for us to begin with Bible authority? Yes. I think it's important because if you don't establish that from the beginning, then my opinion it, or it, their perception is what I'm saying to them is an opinion thing. Even if it's or my interpretation, even if I'm going to the scripture. So if we establish Bible authority, then, and, and then it, it's hard to talk to somebody that doesn't believe the Bible at all. I don't believe that. Absolutely. That's, that's a fantastic point. So we, we begin, I'll get to you in just a second, Paulette. We begin with this idea that we have a standard. We have something that we all gathered around. And you may have opinions, and I have opinions, and those are great, but we are gonna, we are gonna have something we have in common in studying the Bible. That gives us a, a, a centralized place to begin. And you mentioned, uh, you know, I don't believe the Bible. That's a really good point. I want to come back to that. Paulette. A lot of people, you know, they have their creeds. And they want that, you know, and, and I think that has to be the basis of our study. The Bible is our only authority. We don't have anybody else's opinion or anything else. We do what the Bible says. And that has to be the starting point. That has to be the point that Yes, I agree. The Bible is where we're going to go. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you can have, you know, things that we that we look at, but it has to be Bible authority first. We can have a hundred different things that say this is what I think you need to do, but we want to come to this agreement that God's way is the best. And how do I know God's way? Is it what this church says, or was that pastor over there says, or is what my family has always believed? How do I know God's way is what God's way is? And that's why we establish biblical authority to say this, this is God's way. And we will just keep coming back to that. This is the way that God has taught us. This is the way that God is describing to us. And, and what if we don't believe the Bible? What if you're talking, you, you, you have a coworker who says, I just flat out don't believe in God. Is this the tool for them? You need to back up a step. You're right. This this is, not going to, this is not going to do anything. This is a tool for people who believe that God exists and believe that the Bible is His Word. If we're not there, we don't start here. We start somewhere else. We back up a step. We need to talk about apologetics. We need to talk about evidences. There's a reason that I believe that God exists. And there's a reason I think you should believe as well. That's not what this class is about. And so if you, if you know somebody that's like that and you, you're wanting to put the gospel in front of them, we have to make sure that the gospel, that it has some traction to get started. I'm not just going to throw that out there. And sometimes I think we do that. Uh, we teach our kids that. We see the song, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And if I don't believe the Bible, if I don't believe that it's the word of God, if I don't have a, a foundation that starts there, then that doesn't mean anything. And that's just a children's song that the nursery kids sing. So we need to make sure we, we recognize where they are and then we start on common ground, common footing. Any other thoughts? Just at some point, there's going to be a disagreement. We've got to figure out how we're going to resolve it. Yes, absolutely. And very limited experience with this, but my experience in the world is all too often we don't disagree on big, big ticket items. We don't disagree that God created the universe. Maybe we disagree on how long it took him, but we don't disagree that he did it. We don't disagree that Jesus is the way to God. 
But we're going to get into some things that we might disagree on. What do we do when that conflict arises? We have to have some place to fall back to to say, we agree that the Bible is God's word. We must agree that it has authority in our lives. So what does it say? So let's get started with that. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, at the very beginning of this, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Those words that begin this, we call the Great Commission, are so much more powerful than just the starting of the verse that tells us baptism is important. We need to make sure that we understand that, the great power in these first couple of words. Jesus Christ, as our book continues, has the right to be our Lord. You hear a lot of times people say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Well, what does that mean when you say that? What does it mean to accept somebody as Lord? What well, means that they have authority? And that's what this, this first section is supposed to try to bring us to see. The Bible is the Word of God. And if we believe that and we believe Christ is our Lord, then what do we see about the Word? The Word must be authoritative. It must mean something in us. And that's a huge disconnect in our society. I think that's very evident in things that are going on right now, that we have people that have very different backgrounds, believe very different things. What's, what has been going on at Asbury is not indicative of what Asbury believes. There are people from all sorts of denominations gathering together from all different beliefs. And okay, we all believe in Jesus, so we have unity. But what happens when we get to things that we don't share a belief in? What happens when we, <clears throat> what happens when we get to a situation where uh, I believe that the Spirit works in these sorts of ways versus another denomination that says, no, the Spirit doesn't work in that way. We have division. Either we have division or we just kind of ignore it and say, well, we all love Jesus, so everything's okay. The Bible is going to call us to say there is a way for us all to be unified. There is a way for us all to stand in solidarity together. But we have to recognize a few things. So these first couple of sections that we're going to look at are extremely, extremely simple. Let me get us started up here. The first one is this. Number one, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I will trust and obey Him. You're not going to find a lot of people that push back. If I believe that in God, I believe in Jesus. You're not going to find a whole lot of people that push back against this. Jesus is my Lord. What did God say about Jesus? According to our material, you've been filling in the blanks. What did God say about Jesus? Listen to him. Listen to him. This is my son. Listen to him. And so we understand just there is a, a holy decree from God that says he has authority for you to, to open your ears, open your hearts to what he says. The Father from heaven has instructed that. As we go on from that, what two things did Jesus say about himself in John chapter 3 and verse 36? The two words that we write in there. Believe and, obey. believe and obey. He who believes in me, he who obeys me, uh, he who believes in me will have life. He who does not obey me will not see life. So Jesus, so we, have, we have right now two figures, one God from heaven saying, look, Jesus, my son, has the right for you to listen to him. And Jesus says, I have the right for you to believe me and obey me. Now, as I said, these are very simple. You think that's... It, it's going to take a lot of time for me to convince somebody that about the gospel. Guess what? Majority of the people that you're going to talk to, those two points right there are just accepted right off the bat. I believe in God. I believe Jesus is his son. Yes, I need to listen to the things that he says. I believe that. And that's why, I, have you ever heard this? That's why I, I read my Bible, but I only read the things written in red. Why? Because that's Jesus' words, Right? And Jesus is the son, and God said, listen to him. And he said, believe me and obey me. So I listen to him, and I read his words. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37 tell us about what Paul said? 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Things that I write are the Lord's commandments. Things that I write are the Lord's commandments. What we're trying to get people to see is, one, something they already typically accept. Jesus is the Lord. He has the right, when he says something, he has the right to say it, and I have the expectation and the responsibility to listen to him. You may get a little bit of pushback when we go into the apostles. 
What about what the apostles wrote? What about what's written there in, in Acts? What about what the, what the epistles from Paul and John and Peter? What about these things? Well, that, that, and that's not what Jesus said. Those aren't his words. That's why I only read the words that are written in red. Well, look, if we're going to establish biblical authority, we're going to recognize that what they inspired men of God wrote was when we write something down, what we have recorded, this is just the same as if God himself had said it. So right off the bat, a very easy thing for us to, to, to understand. This is not rocket science in any way. Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life. He deserves to be listened to and obeyed. Has that always been the case? Has that always been the factor throughout the history of mankind? The second point makes that. God's word has always needed to be respected and has always needed to be lived by. And we're going to go through this one really, really quickly. So there in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Revelation both give this same instruction not to add to and not to take away from the word of God. That is a commandment. That, so God has always said in all ages that my word is to be held with honor and you are to respect it by not putting your thoughts into it and not diminishing its power by taking away. He has always said that about his word. But in 2 John 9, he tells us, and, and this is maybe a good thing for us to just consider when we're studying with someone, if we want God near us, and the reason I say it that way is that's a very popular thing right now. There is a, it's a very popular thing to say, I don't feel close to God. I don't feel near to God. I don't feel like he is in my heart. Well, there's a reason that being popular. The Bible talks about that. It talks about this a notion of dwelling with or abiding in. In 2 John 9, he says that those who go too far and do not abide in the teaching of Christ do not have God. The one who abides in his teaching, and that continues, he was both the Father and the Son. And so we establish very quickly what this is that we're talking about. This is the Word of God, that which is recorded the words of Jesus are authoritative, spoken both by God and by Jesus himself, and the men who followed after him and continued what he had instructed them to do. And there are other passages we could go to to see that, but just very quickly we can recognize that they too wrote, spoke the commandments of God, and that from the beginning that's always been the case. God wants his word respected. And there's a couple things at the end of that section, verse 2. A couple of examples of what happens when you don't do that. What happens when you don't respect the Word of God? Does it help you draw closer to Him, or does it harm you? And so you have Adam and Eve, you have Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10. What else? What other things, if you were maybe thinking about this, what other examples might you give of people who didn't respect the Word of God and, and it led to problems with, with them and their relationship with God? Who might you think of? Present. Uzzah. Yeah, exactly. Uzzah. So David has been given, they've been given instructions on how to carry the ark. And, and David does not respect that in any way and, and says, in trying to do a good thing, that's one, a, a thing to go with Uzzah, is they were, they were trying to honor God. He doesn't deserve to be carried around a bunch of stinky old poles. Let's build a brand new cart for him. And yet that led, when Uzzah touched the cart, when it's, the oxen stumbled, it led to the loss of his life. That's a great one. What else? What other examples might you think of? Saul. Saul. We talked about Old Testament or New Testament? Old. Old Testament. Old Testament. Yeah, we'll go with the Amalekites. There we go. Saul and the Amalekites. Saul, God has given him instruction on what he is to do, and it leads to the, when he, when he spares them, it leads to the loss of the kingdom. He loses this, this, this great gift that God had placed in front of him. Um, the ones that I wrote down, David transporting the ark, Moses striking the rock, Aiken, as they get into Jericho, the ten spies. I got Maddie Sue's hand up. Maddie Sue, who are you thinking of? Jonah. Jonah. That's, we talked about Jonah on the first one, didn't we? That's a really good one to think about as well. God gave him instruction, and he didn't listen to it. He didn't respect it. Evie, you got your hand up? Ananias. Ananias. Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Yeah, there was, some, there was a whole lot going on there where they didn't respect the Word of God and it led to the loss of their lives. We see these examples throughout Scripture. And those examples are supposed to instill in us that the Word of God is valuable. The Word of God is mighty. 
The Word of God is deserving of honor. It deserves to be respected. It is, it, it is something that we should handle with great reverence and respect. So when you do go through all that, okay, so we've talked to people and we go, hey, look, what Jesus said, that's the Word of God. God himself said that you need to listen to him. What his apostles wrote, that's important. We need to listen to that as well. We've had examples in the past. Everybody says, we agree with all that. But, you know, I just, I didn't go to seminary. So how am I supposed to understand all of this? And it's an extremely common thought. And I'm not, I, I think we want to make sure that we don't just jump straight to, to certain denominations and say, well, you know, the, the Catholics will say that the priests have to be the ones that do the teaching because they're the ones with the ordination of God upon them. This is, this is a global problem within those that believe in God and believe in Christ that I can't understand his word. And so the next point that we go to in this is to see that if we read it, if we read it with an honest heart, we can. We can understand what he's saying. What two words in, in, in Ephesians 3... You're going to have to turn your pages over. In Ephesians 3, on page 2, what two words did we write down that Paul said about, about the Word of God? Understand. Understand. You can understand it. By referring to this, when you read it, you can understand. In Ephesians, that's Ephesians 3, 4. In Ephesians 5, 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In fact, I just... As, as a, a bit of an example, and, and this is in, in here, and you could be something good to have done with, with the people that you're studying with. Somebody read Acts chapter 2. One of, I tell you, one of our, our young gentlemen over here, turn to Acts chapter 2, and I want you to read 36 through 41 for us. Because what it's telling us, if what Paul is saying is true, is that when we read the Word of God, we don't need somebody that's had a, a special uh, they've, they've got a, a master's in divination. They have a, a special document that says they're worthy of it. They, they don't need some sort of special experience that shows that the Spirit has enlightened upon them and they can therefore are, are now selected by God to tell you what it means. Paul says if you read it, whoever you are, if you read it, you can understand it. Who, who's got this over here? Jackson, go ahead. 30, uh, 26, no, no, not 26, 36 through 41, just yes, so. But all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made in both Lord and Christ, the Jesus whom we crucified. Now when, they, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. All right. That's a simple passage. When we read that, I want you just to think of some things, and, and go ahead and shout, you can shout them out or raise your hands, how you want to do What are some things that you learn, that you understand from this passage about what God's will is? What is the will of God? Or maybe let's rephrase it another way while you're thinking about, thinking about that question. What does God want people to do? What do we learn in Acts chapter 2, 36 through 42? What does God want people to do? To hear this. Say it again. To hear this. He wants them to hear this. Absolutely. In fact, he wants them not just to hear it, but he wants them to do something in them. What did it say in verse 36? Or verse 37? Be cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. God wants a response. Absolutely. May Get baptized. He said baptism. He, that's something that he instructed them to do. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Jackson? Know that it's for everybody. Know that it's for everybody. That's fantastic. God wants... We read a very simple passage. You go, look, God wants this for everyone. Say it again. To repent. He wants people to turn from their sin. What about this is mysterious? What about this is really, really hard? What does God want them to do after they do those things? To live faithfully? What did it say? To, to continue. They wanted them to continue and, dev and be devoted. Live faithful. 
These are not hard. Is there, are there hard things in the Bible to understand? Paul is not saying in Ephesians 3 there's nothing hard in the Bible to understand. But when we get to those hard things, you know what we need to do? Study. It might take some time. It might mean that we have to get some tools to help us. This is not the, the, the place to go through all of those tools and, and show somebody how to use every one of those. That's certainly something, maybe as you get to that last lesson and they say, hey, look, I'm really interested in this book. Can we study that book together? Yeah, let's study it. Let's talk about some tools that we have to help us in that study. But when we simply read the Word of God, we don't need some sort of special gift that's been given to us. The Word is the gift, and it is simple and easy to understand what God wants. But you will hear that from time to time. People say, well, maybe because we disagree. Well, you think you're smarter than. I had a guy say one time about me. Kyle's out there running around. He doesn't even have a college degree. Maybe there are some of you here that are learning that for the first time. I don't have a college degree. But that's okay. That's okay because you don't need a college degree to understand what God is saying in the big majority of His Word, especially in all the passages that are talking about our relationship with Him. It is simple. If you will read it with an honest heart, you can understand now, these first three things, as I said, are fairly simple things. They're fairly simple points. Is there somebody else got a hand up? I'm sorry. Over here somewhere, is it Miss Carol? Miss Carol. Before I start the study, I always pray. That's a great, great thing to do. Before I start study, I, I like to always begin with a prayer as well. That's what Miss Carol said. I always pray before I begin a study. But in that prayer... We're not saying, God, I, I, need, I need some holy you know, revelation to come down. Sometimes people get this notion. They'll go to passages like James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. They'll go to that passage and begin to talk about how wisdom from God tells us, gives us some special revelation of what God's Word says. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think if we're not beginning our study with prayer and asking God to help us to, to see clearly Your Word, we're starting in the wrong place. We need to speak and we need to ask uh, in, in ways that show, I need God. I need God as I go through this. But was any of that that we read something that was that hard to understand? No, it's, it's simple to understand. The problem usually gets in this next point that we're going to look at. The problem gets in our biases. The things that we have held up as authoritative in our lives that oftentimes causes us to miss the simple messages of the gospel. And so that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at. And one thing I want to ask is these, these other, uh, we're calling false standards of authority. Well, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? They're false. We're going to have to just have nothing to do with them. You all have looked through this lesson. I hope you've already read through it. Which one of those is just inherently wicked and evil? Exactly. That's the answer. Great job. You all got it right. Nothing. There is not a one in there that is inherently wrong. They can be right, they can be helpful, but which one of them has the right to rule your life? Again, you're right. Not a one of them. Not a single one. And so we need to make sure that we, we reveal that as we go into this. You're going to maybe pick, start stepping on some toes in this part of this lesson. You're going to maybe start getting into things that go, I don't like the way this makes me feel. We want to make sure that we are clear. I'm not saying, or the first one is, is conscience. I'm not saying that if you feel like something is wrong, or if you feel like something is right, and it goes against the Bible, that I'm just calling you out as some terrible thing. Man, that came a lot quicker than I thought. I'm not saying that you're just terrible and there's no hope for you. I'm not saying if, you're, if your pastor has said this, that they're just automatically a bad person, and you should never, ever listen to what your family says. It's not what we're saying at all. We're saying, who has the right to rule? That's what authority is about. Who has the right to tell you how to live your life? And so this first one, conscience. Somebody read Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. It's, it's point two in our, in our books there. Somebody read that out loud. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. So when we come to our conscience, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. Can our consciences be right? Can you have a conscience that's right? Absolutely you can. But a conscience is built off of knowledge. So if you have somebody with very little knowledge, 
I don't know where Atticus is. Atticus is back there. Guess what? Atticus has a very weak conscience right now because he doesn't have a lot to pack it with. But you have somebody with a really big knowledge, their conscience is a little bit more well-rounded. But when that knowledge doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God, you may have a big conscience that's full of information but doesn't tell you how to interpret the life that you live in relation to the God that has a right to rule over it. So we need to understand that about conscience. Conscience can be a great thing when it's trained, when it's perfected through the power of God and his word. So there's a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. Have you ever met a person that was just so sure they were right that it almost killed them? I have. I've got a picture of him. And no, this is not a picture of Atticus aged 12 years. This is a picture of me. This is a picture that my mom took, and I think she just had to take this picture because we had been sledding. My brother got out to the sledding hill first, and I was shortly behind him. And she, after all this came down, she cleaned me up. She set me down, and she said, you sit still. And that's probably why I look so angry because I'm taking a picture of this. We get outside, and my brother goes, Kyle, don't go down this, the hill right here. There's rocks at the bottom, and you'll get hurt. And my brother's four years younger than me, and I am not advocating what I said to him. I said, shut up. I'm not stupid. I'll do what I want. And I got a face full of rocks before I got to the bottom of that hill. Bloody and everything. And I, to his credit, I, I tell you, there's been a lot of times where he didn't impress me, but he impressed me here when he did not say, I told you so siblings, he just picked me up and he ran in and said, mom, Kyle got hurt and he come out and helped me in. And mom said, oh yeah, I'm, you're going to get your payback for this though, Kyle. People can be so convinced that they are right. So convinced that they're right, but that is not the way that leads to truth. In fact, it oftentimes lead to death. Some people that you might bring up, our book talks about Paul. Paul was convinced that he was right. And yet, what we see here in Acts chapter 26, it says he did things that were hostile to the name of Jesus. Was Paul wrong when he persecuted Christians? I hope we would all see that very quickly. Of course he was. Yes, Paul was wrong. What that tells me is I can feel right about something and still be wrong about it. The wisdom of men is another one. Men can be wrong. And that right there shouldn't be something that is... That, that is a statement I think a lot of people in this room, in fact, maybe 50% of the room in here is going to go, oh yeah, we know men can be wrong. But boy, all too, all too often we don't feel like we are. Our faith cannot rest in the wisdom of men. That's what 1 Corinthians 2.5 tells us. Paul specifically came and didn't speak with flattery, didn't use powerful arguments of persuasion, but simply put the gospel in front of the Corinthians because he did not want them resting their confidence in the wisdom of men. Now, why might that be an important thing to bring up? Since we're running out of time, that's an important thing to bring up because there's a lot of people today that still do that. My preacher said, my pastor said it really well. That's great. But gospel writers, people of the word, God does not want you resting in what men said. Maybe they have a lot of things right, but can we just agree that the word of God is what has the right to rule our lives? So let's just go back to that. Okay, well, your, your pastor believes that. That's great. But what, let's just go back to the Bible. What does that say? The wisdom of man never brought people to God. But Paul says the foolishness of his message has saved people. Now, why do you think, and we're going to kind of probably get close to our time with this question. Why do you think God, or why do you think Paul said that? Why did Paul write to the Corinthians and say, the foolishness of the message is saving people. Why did he call the message foolish? It's upside down from what the world believes. It was upside down from what the world believes. It was completely the opposite of what they expected, what they wanted, and what they long held. The reason I bring that up, and we're going to start here next, next week with the majority, and we'll move through those a little bit quicker so we can get through lesson two next week. We're going to have to speed it up. But the reason I bring that up is this. You do not live in a world that is drastically different than what Paul had to deal with. People thought the same way. They said, my pastor says this. Except they wouldn't say pastor. They'd say, my, my rabbi says this. Or this philosopher says that. We're not in that drastically different of a world. And yet, in those moments, the gospel was interjected into people's lives and it turned the world upside down. 
It can still do the same thing today. That's what the whole purpose of these classes are, is to help us be ready and prepared to put that gospel message into the lives of others. So there's our two bells. We're going we're gonna to stop right there. As I said, next week, we'll pick back up when, on page three, point C, the majority. And when we do that, have those filled out and go ahead and fill out lesson two. And we're going to try to get through both of them for next week. Be prepared for that. Uh, we-